Hi, I'm Andrew Drain, Principal of Harcourts, who's living, and welcome to another edition of This Is Hills Living. And today we're going to have a chat with Troy McPhee, Director and Partner of Advisor FP, a financial planning company based in Parramatta with a tagline, Creating, Managing and Protecting Wealth. Let's go and see Troy. So Troy, why did you get into financial planning? I think it was by default because one of the things, I was working for one of the large institutions at the time. Uh, my dad, uh, on the back of the recession we had to have, he took a, an early retirement. And at the time, the advice he was being given was, was a little bit confusing and in, in retrospect, it wasn't necessarily in his best interests. And that always that stood with me because um, at no stage were they talking about what he should be doing uh, with his money, it was all about the numbers. and. Uh, that's something that stood with me through time, and uh, I've been working here since 19, sorry, 2002, uh, so 10 years later, and uh, I, I try to put myself in that position, try to make people's lives better, but as opposed to just focusing on the numbers, I want to focus on the goals that they have. You know, the GFC comes through and you, you start to question what, uh, what, what the principles of financial planning are doing and, and what they can deliver. Um, but realistically, the GFC is a once in a lifetime, probably multi-lifetime event. Mm. And um, you just, in fact, having a steady hand on the tiller during those times is more important than just the numbers for, for most clients. Mm. Would you say that you've improved your business model since the GFC? Yeah, yeah, so the conversations we're having with clients is deeper than during the GFC. We had uh, two years prior to the GFC kicking in, we'd moved to a fee-for-service model. And that was also soon after the, um, the, the Howard government had convinced everyone to put a million dollars into super. So put a million dollars into super in the lead up to 2007, market dropped 40% over the next uh, 18 months. And that scared a lot of people. And so you were drawing upon all the things you knew from a technical perspective, your education, the things that you knew were to be true were being tested during that era. And um, we adapt and evolved our business to, to respond accordingly. So in your business, being client-oriented is not just good business. It has a, a profound effect on people's lives. Yeah. How important is that, Troy? Yeah, it does. It's, it's very important. In fact, uh, it, it's, it's a misnomer that, that financial planning isn't just for retirees. Uh, sure, superannuation retirement planning is vitally important because at some stage the, uh, the checks are going to stop. But more importantly, especially in today's time frame. You've got uh, young Australians can't afford to get into housing. Well, that's all about cash flow management. You've got people who are taking on big mortgages and so they've got to protect their income. You've got to look at how to manage your superannuation effectively to avoid a, an issue like a market downturn. And paying off debts is, is important, both good debt and bad debt saving for kids' education, all of those things are elements where a financial planner can step in. Uh, some of the greatest achievements in my life have actually had nothing to do with the numbers in, in, in my career. Um, so there's been times when uh, we, we've, we've had to walk as a, almost as a co-pilot along someone's life journey with them and make sure that, that they are able to not only get there safely, but they're making the right decisions along the way because it's easy to get distracted by noise and news headlines and uh, you know, when markets are running hot, everybody's happy to, to move in. When markets come off, uh, people want to want to bail for the exit. So mm -hmm. it's really important to, to be able to keep uh, a long-term view and keep people on track with those goals. So did you make a conscious decision at some stage in your business life to, to uh, stand by your customer and, and see them through the good times and the bad times rather yeah. than just give them advice walk away and say you're on your own. Yeah, so we, we make a point of um, making sure clients come in on a regular basis at least once a year. And so we're resetting the goals, the strategies, the things that they say are important because every year markets change, tax legislation changes, the uh, the ability to, to um, manage finances is, is quite a dynamic thing. So the conscious decision is, yes, we're, we're there setting goals, but when, um, <clears throat> pardon me, when things are poor and it's bleak, well, we've got to be there and have the difficult conversations and say, you need to tighten your belt and, uh, and, and focus on your budget. 
no, you can't take that holiday because you've said you want to buy the car or, or the kids' education things, and that's about prioritising. So, Troy, in a business like this, how do you go about attracting clients? From a formal perspective, we don't actually actively market. Uh, I think the, the, the testimony of what we do comes through from our existing clients. We, um, we, we find that traditional four Ps, product, place, price, promotion, don't really fit for a, a, a tailoring of financial planning advice. Because um, every financial plan is bespoke to that client's individual goals, dreams, aspirations and, and financial circumstances. So when clients come in to see us, they are generally referred to us by their trusted community, you know, their friends, family, the people who they draw um, reference from. And th that actually assists us. So. We don't uh, actively market, we don't advertise, we, we just deliver great service and, and that's how we've obtained the, the growth rates that we've, uh, that we've achieved. So effectively word of mouth. Exactly, exactly. So Troy, we've touched on this a little bit already. You spend a lot of your time telling people how to run the financial side of their lives. But what about Advisor FPs of business? Why is it a good business? Or what do you think is a good business? I don't think we tell people how to run their lives. It's actually the other way around. They tell us what they're trying to achieve and we put the stepping stones in place to assist them to navigate that outcome. Uh, the reason why I think we're a good business is simply we invest back into the financial planning process. So all of our advisors, and we've got five in the business at the moment, they are committed to ongoing education and professional development. We've also got uh, a realistic understanding as to how many clients each advisor can manage. And gone are the days where you'd have a, a uh, actually I won't even call them an advisor, but a, an in, a superannuation or insurance salesperson, and they've got thousands of clients. Well, we know to effectively manage the demands that, that ongoing client service can place on an advisor, you capped it around about 80 to 100 genuine relationships, and, and that's pretty important. So you've almost developed a sweet spot. <coughs> So there's yeah. a sweet spot of, of clients you can look after to deliver the maximum, the optimal amount of service. Yeah, because every client you put into that mix after that, well, you're diluting the service experience for everybody. But we also um, build in into our HR reward and recognition systems that uh, our staff, the people who support us to do the job that, uh, that we need to do, they have uh, ongoing education themselves and uh, every time they take on a subject, and complete that subject, or we reward and recognise each individual staff member. So we've got a constant um, growth of our, of our knowledge platform inside the business. So Troy, how important are your own personal attributes when it comes to relating to clients? And what are some of the attributes that you possess that make you a good financial planner? I think being able to relate to people is the most important part of the job. Someone, one of my early mentors said to me, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that, that remains true today as it did 25 years ago. Because you can actually teach the technical stuff. It's when you are as emotionally invested in the process as your client is that, um, that you can actually deliver some tangible value because financial planning is, is about managing future uncertainties. And managing future uncertainties is a difficult thing when a person is suffering a financial crisis Equally, it's difficult when they are in the middle, uh, in the midst of a windfall. And keeping them on a path is, is pretty important. So coaching, remaining disciplined, having regular contact and reviews, they're all the elements that I think are appropriate. And I would imagine empathy as well, especially in times when times are tough. Yeah, look, some of my, uh, some of my most treasured moments have been times when I've laughed, cried, uh, experienced the full range of emotions with clients. And... Uh, because there is, they allow you into the inner sanctum of what they, their family, are trying to achieve, it's, uh, it's something that you don't take lightly. Um, you're there through thick and thin. What's difficult is when you're managing multiple generations and you are hearing the family dynamics as much as, uh, as you are hearing the, the, the financial pressure points. And uh, that's an interesting thing to navigate around. Well, further to that, then you're dealing with people's finances and money, and obviously they need to be very comfortable with you in disclosing, as you talked about, family secrets and, and their financial uh, uh, goals and their current financial situation. Um, so what are some of the things that you do to make them feel comfortable? How do you make yeah. them feel comfortable? Look, I don't think you can, you can fake genuine trust. 
uh, or, or genuine interest in, in a person's um, life. But as an advisor, you're coming from the outside and you have to be integrated into the family mm. unit. So it takes some time to build that trust. And there's gonna be times when we drop the ball and we have to, to wear that. And there's other times when we have to have a difficult conversation with clients. But more importantly, if I, if I believe there's not a genuine fit between myself and the person sitting opposite me who I've met for the first time, I will do my best to try to find another fit for them. You know, I think any client that we take on, um, A, we have to find that there's a, there's a, a cultural alignment uh, B, we have to know that we can actually deliver value to them. Uh, and there's probably an element that, that, that they, not only do we need to know that we can deliver value, but will they recognise that value? And that's, that's most important. Um, so if a client, or, or if I can answer yes to all of those for a client and they can answer yes to that for me, then I think there's a, there's a fit. Uh, and that's the establishment of the relationship and some clients so open that they'll give you immediate trust, they'll give everything to you, and other clients it takes uh, some time, years. Moving on from that, trust is obviously important because there's gonna be certain outcomes in the advice that you give that's gonna be contrary to what was predicted was gonna happen. Yep. So how important is that trust with your client? It, it can't be understated. Trust is, is everything uh, because a person's giving you their their life's goals, fears, dreams, aspirations, and you know what they earn, you know how much they spend, you know where they want to live, where they want to have their kids educated, what they want to drive, where they want to holiday. Trust is difficult to earn, but it's easy to lose. And so that, that's what I was making the point about before. So we may get the wrong form sent through to a client or not reply to an email or whatever, whatever it is where we've dropped the ball, we know we have to work twice as hard to win that back. So I think what's more important is that we're not just fair weather friends. So if a client can't afford a particular holiday, well, we'll tell them. Or we'll show them if you, if you overspend here, here's what the financial impact is going to be on your, your assets, your liabilities, your cash flow. And how's that generally accepted by people? Tell them that, look, you can't go to uh, Europe this year, you're gonna to have to stick yeah. to the Gold Coast. Yeah. If a person's got their heart set on something, they'll always do it anyway. My job is to point out the risks and, uh, and let them make a decision based on the educated uh, numbers. So how important do you think it is to enjoy what you do or your work and how do you make it enjoyable? If you don't enjoy your work, it comes through. I think we've, we've all experienced being in different areas, whether it be in retail, in, in hospitality, etc., where you know the person just doesn't love their work. Like any job, there's days when it does feel like work, but for the most part, um, we look for people who are generally invested into into the job. You have to like it because there, there are things outside of your span of influence. Financial planning is all about managing future risks and variability. And so we, we have to be conscious that sometimes the tides goes against us and, uh, and, and we have to manage that accordingly. But there, as I said, there's days when it feels like work, but for the most part, when you're making a genuine difference in, in, a, in a family's life, um, it, it doesn't feel like work. Uh, generally speaking, I'm, I'm a very goal-oriented person, both professionally and, and in my personal life. And having a business partner where we set a strategic plan every three and five years and, and manage key milestones towards that, and it also gives our, our team something to, to aim for. So our team, we have uh, regular, so not only talking about the operational stuff on a regular basis, but on a less frequent basis, bringing them into the boardroom and, and telling them about what's going on inside the business, what are the, some of the strategic goals or projects we're working on on a quarterly basis. And we also share with them what our clients are thinking. We do an annual survey, and so that is a way for us, to, for our clients to tell us whether we're doing a good job or could be improving in, in particular areas. There's, uh, there's nine KPIs that our clients assess us on. And we're pleased to say that, that we're, we're across the board improving in all of them to the point where we're ahead of national average. So our clients are telling us we're doing a good job. Our business plan is telling us we are on track to achieving our key goals. That's pretty rewarding. So would you say that, um and something I'm big on, do you think that having a vision or a strategy is important for your team 
to see that you do have a vision you're working towards? Yeah, so the the team needs to see progress. Otherwise, we're in the fortunate position. We're sitting in here with the clients and we're keeping them on track and we can show them that, that they're having uh, a great outcome. But our team who are supporting us, it's like the roadies and the rock stars. Mm. The, the rock stars get up on stage, they play the gig, they leave, and the roadies do all the setting up and the packing up. Well, our staff are probably akin to the roadies and they don't always get the benefit of, of seeing the joy or the sadness in a client's face um, when, when you've got to have conversations. So keeping them on track with our strategic plan and, and talking to them about what we're focused in on this quarter and that we can tick it off as an achievement, that then feeds into the intangibles of the reward and recognition program that we have. Troy, what about the bigger influence on your business, like the economy? Obviously the economy changes, um, and you'd be aware of that more than most. How have you dealt with that in the past? And I guess the GFC is a big one that we can talk about. Yeah, so I'll talk about the GFC, on because that's, anyone who's been invested um, it will will understand the, the, the fear that, that was resonating throughout most pre-retirees, retirees at the time. And what, what I look for is, well, what are the economic indicators telling us? How can we manage the things that we're in control of? And how can we build risk parameters on the things we can't? So we can't control what um, markets do. What we can do is take uh, an approach such as diversification. We can quarantine money that a person has earmarked for spending and we can put that to the side and have the rest invested for a three to five year view. We can control the rate of tax that a person pays in terms of different strategies. So controlling the variables that are controllable and managing the variables that aren't is, is pretty important. If I then look at the more recent changes in the, uh, the, the election, so business, investment, consumer confidence, everything pulled back in anticipation of a change in government. And it, I mean, you'd see it in your own um, business. So property sales are going through at a, at a discount to what they were previously recorded as. And I think largely the anticipation of a change in government was going to be part and parcel of that. Now, when we have to look at policies that are potentially coming down the line, like uh, uh, the removal of excess franking credits, which was one of the policies from the opposition, we had to reconfigure all portfolios potentially to offset that. So if retirees were losing that additional tax benefit that was there, and it's actually not a benefit, it's actually avoiding the double taxation of things, but we had to then put in countermeasures to that. Well, if they were getting a benefit of an extra 1.5% by way of a tax refund, from where were they going to get that 1.5% from other sources? So they're the kinds of things we, we take a look at. So the broader economy, uh, the individual policies, um, then how does that distill down to uh, an individual portfolio? And that probably illustrates the reason why we know you can't have an infinite number of client relationships. Because you're proactive, not reactive. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you knew it might, might have happened with Frank and Credits and you're proactive in at least having a plan or a strategy in place if that did happen. Yeah, so franking credits policy comes out. What does that mean for Mrs. Smith's portfolio of Australian equities? So that was Troy McPhee, Director and Partner Advisor FP. He actually is my financial advisor and hopefully one day he'll be yours too. Troy, thanks for your time. Thank really you. Appreciate it, mate. So what we've learned from Troy today is develop trust with the client because trust is everything. Provide a depth of service. Be concerned with the customer's whole life. Make them come away feeling like they've just made a friend. Stay on top of the news. And people use a personal trainer for health, use a financial advisor for wealth. Well, that was Troy McPhee for Advisor FP, and I'm Andrew Drain from Harcourts, who's living. In our next video, we're going to be talking to famous restaurateur in Borkham Hills, Josh Mason from Quart Dining. I'll see you there.